Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This is the last episode of season two. We're through season two. And you know what else? It's episode number 50 of Go With The Heat. It's an anniversary? No. <laughs> <laughs> Although me and John have been here the entire mm-hmm. time, this now means that Melissa has done just as many episodes as Jenna. So I think for season three, episode one, we got to get the we got to get the band back together. We got to get everyone. <laughs> get everybody to come back. <laughs> <laughs> uh. We're talking about season two, episode 22, Sons and Lovers. It originally premiered on May 9th, 1986. It was directed by John Nicolella. Now, you'll be surprised. This is not his last episode that he will direct. He will come back and direct one more episode. But this is the last episode that John is the producer of Miami Vice. He will step aside and Dick Wolf will take over as a co-producer of season three of Miami Vice. The writer is Dennis Cooper. He wrote the teleplay for Made for Each Other. He'll direct or write four more episodes in the future. He will become the other co-producer for season three of Miami Vice. John Nicolò is going to step aside. Dennis Cooper is going to step in and Dick Wolf is going to step in as the new producers, which begs the question. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let let me get this straight. So the guy directing the episode is stepping aside as a producer for an episode written by the guy that's going to replace him. Yes. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly what's happening. You're kind of fired. And here's a guy. This is an episode we can run with. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Uh, We'll let you direct (laughs) this one. (laughs) This is the guy that's going to replace you, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Begs the question why some storylines never got revisited because the he was still there so it's not like he left or something yeah yeah (laughs) yeah don't even we can't get started early i'll take up too much time (laughs) before we get started i could check in and see what's going on each other's lives and guys melissa did not go no i didn't (laughs) i did with our kids we went to phoenix comic-con it was the great comic book it's one of the biggest comic-con conventions here on the west coast it was an amazing day it's Memorial Day weekend in Phoenix, so it's the surface of the sun outside. It'd be hot. <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> the day before we go, the Phoenix police arrest a man armed with four guns and knives who was on a mission to kill the Green Power Ranger who was guest speaking at the convention. So when we went on Friday, extra security was in place. Luckily, they caught him. Nothing happened. Everyone was safe. They arrested him. Nothing happened. But that also means that there was extra security to get into Comic-Con. It took us so, over. So, th- so now I'm even more confused. The article I read didn't specify who it was who was there to kill. Just that he thought he was the Punisher. Yeah, he and he specific- had ninja stars, which didn't make sense. Well, apparently uh, he specific- never carried ninja stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently he specifically said he was there for the Green Power Ranger because the, the guy who plays the Green Power Ranger, I don't know his name. I probably should know that. But he mm-hmm. came out and said, like, thank you to the police department. All I know is that because of the heightened security, it took us over three hours to get into Comic-Con. We missed all of the morning panels. But luckily, we got there just in time to walk in and see the greatest Batman in the history of Batman give his panel (laughs) in Kevin Conroy, the voice of Batman in Batman the Animated Series, Justice League, Batman Beyond, basically all the good Batman games. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, all the yeah, all the video games are the good ones. That's his voice. <laughs> Our kids were pumped. <laughs> Unfortunately, pals, there was no Miami Vice stuff there. I was quite let down. Disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, we have a great, fantastic. Even though Comic Con didn't have support of Miami Vice, this episode was a fantastic episode of Miami Vice. It hits all the right chords and leaves you kind of angry at the end because you know what's going to happen in the future. But we're going to let Melissa talk about that at the end. (laughs) We're going to let her (laughs) her anger out. (laughs) Let's go over and give our rundown of this episode. We open up and Tubbs and Crockett are going to make a deal. This is probably the closing deal of a long investigation. They come in for the first two minutes, three minutes. There's no talking. There's... Three drug dealers inside of the room, Tubbs and Crockett, come in. They exchange the briefcase. The drug dealers open up. Probably no talking. No shaking of hands. Like the guy goes (laughs) to try and shake his hand and suddenly he's like, nope, not having it. Yeah, it was real salty. Yeah, it's real real salty. I like how like Tubbs and the other guy look at each other and like look each other up and down and don't say anything. Like, "Hmm." (laughs) 
did anyone else get the like Pulp Fiction vibe? You know, from like you remember the scene with uh, Travolta and Samuel L. Jackson when they go visit the college kids. Oh yes, like I yeah. almost got like at the beginning, like I almost got that feel when Tubbs and Crockett go walking in. Based on Miami Vice architecture so far, I wasn't sure if this was an abandoned building or if this was actually the theme of the room. <laughs> yeah, I think it's abandoned. It's just yeah, but it does look like it looks like someone had black paint and then they like tried to paint white over it and it didn't mm-hmm. go so well. I don't know. Across the street, the B team and the vice teams are watching what's happening, but the the dealers knew that they were cops ahead of time. They they weren't talking for a reason. They pull over the ice chest that's full of drugs, but inside of there is a gun. They pull the guns on the duo, make them sit in a chair, and across the street, luckily. There's a random member of the country band Alabama with his sniper rifle. <laughs> the Latin? <laughs> the, is he the Latin member? Because he's clearly Latin. <laughs> he just had a great flannel and a, and a, yeah, I know, and a, a mullet yeah. going on, the yeah. nice tight pants. Like I just pictured him as being a country music star on the weekends <laughs> and then sniper saving people across Maybe. the city. <laughs> So the drug dealers pull the wire from Tubbs. They lose communication. The backup starts running across the street, but they're going to be too late. Before then, Alabama is able to sh- to shoot and wound Mendez, who ends up being an important character in the first half of this episode. The duo get a hold of some guns. They shoot and kill another person. And the third person escapes through a closet in a hole in the closet and is able to escape out the building. But we'll, when the backup comes running into the building, we find out that that sniper was not with the Miami Vice or the Miami PD. Switek says that none of them fired a shot. And then we go to the opening credits. So right out of the gate, it's mystery on who wants to kill who is protecting who wants to protect yeah, the duo protecting Tubbs and crockett when we come back from the opening credits we're at the precinct and this is just a short scene where they're recapping with castillo what happened um mendez what was throwing them off was that mendez was working with a third party and that's who the person is that escaped is also the person who made the deal go south he's the one that pointed to them to pull the wire and pulled the gun out of the ice chest you said mendez being an important character in the first part he's important in the way that we don't need to show him or pay <laughs> him again no he's just there Let's in refer spirit to him as Des. yes i mean he'll give he's important but we don't have to show him again let's not do that again mendes was the person that they were working with and so that's who their mm-hmm. in was that's who their with. in was yeah but there's this other guy that was the snitch that, that set, set him up, up with, with mendes, mendes. Yeah. and so castillo is salty Again, use that word with the backup with Switek and Zito. He said backup was sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, the well, I mean, did you see Switek just hanging out the window? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And he couldn't even Ooh. get up the stairs, which which makes me think, though, like I'm, I'm have a question about this whole guy that got out through the closet. Isn't that weren't they on like the third or fourth floor of that building? They were even higher than so that. So why'd they say he went to the sewer? <laughs> they said that he that that closet goes down to the sewer system. So we that's why we couldn't get him. I'm confused. Did what he kind of down crazy the pipes? closet is this? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Did he yeah. shimmy down clo- the pipes? Does, does the closet have a toilet in it? Like, how does that connect <laughs> to the know. sewer? Well, because the backup team, they were on the second floor. That's what I'm saying. The second floor of the building across the street. So and they, they looked right in. Them. Yeah. yeah. So they looked right in. Mm-hmm. They could see in. So where does this magic closet go? <laughs> and is there just a gaping hole that's your toilet? Or what is it? Like... <laughs> That bugged me the whole time. Like they're not on the first floor. How did they get to the sewer from there? It's their ninja turtle it's escape pad. Cross space. Yeah, exactly. What the hell? Well, the duo run off. They're gonna go talk to their snitch. And this is actually kind of a funny scene when they catch up with him at a hotel. They have him blindfolded. They come busting into a hotel room. His name is Vega, and he's the man that they use to get set up with Mendez. And they're threatening to throw him out the window unless he tells them. Who ratted them out to Mendez and this other guy that they were cops? And at first Someone he's like, "No, I'm not going to tell you anything." Cash. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> There's a couple different references here, right? Yeah. Because they they finally get out of him that it was him that yep. set up because there's a million dollar bounty to find Ricardo Tubbs alive, and then they still pretend like they're going to throw him out the window, but it turns out they're on the first floor. So when they throw him out, Gina and Trudy are waiting outside, and then Crockett says, "Book him, Dano." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, the Book of Dano reference is pretty good. And the fact that the snitch was an idiot, because I mean, 
mean, if you don't go up any stairs or a lot of stairs, then you're probably not very high in the building. Exactly. I and when you first so. get in that scene, I'm, I always wondered, like at first, like why do they have them blindfolded? Like, yeah. They, he knows who they are, and I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. He's gonna <laughs> pretend to throw out the window. <laughs> well, yeah, they pretend to throw them out the window, but it's like you have to actually go up a flight of stairs to make that actually be threatening. Do you yeah. think they like got to the top Unless and walked down never, the stairs yeah. and walked back up the stairs? Just like, make them, like, like totally carried confused. him down the stairs, back down the stairs, and they made him walk up, then carried him back down. Yeah, just like make him go up or, random or did stairs. They get, they, what, did they get the elevator and open the door and close the door and then open <laughs> yeah. it back up and go Maybe. out? Yeah, it could be an elevator and using no. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> We're using so, too much logic here. Yeah, I know. Science does not come into play when it's Miami Vice. <laughs> Let's the get beat. to the montage of the sweaty tubs loving. <laughs> oh, God. I was like, ugh. Well, the key here is that we find that, that, that we now know that there's a million dollar bounty to find R- Ricardo Tubbs alive. So that's why everyone's turning on everyone. Cooper and Burnett aren't that good at cover. Everyone just knows that it's Ricardo Tubbs. Somehow they were able to crack their cover <laughs> and find him. We're over at the precinct. They're looking up Calderon and it's like, yeah, he's still dead. It says right here in the file. He's I don't still know why dead. They, oh, yeah, because he says, you forgot that part where he says it was Calderon that oh, is yes. looking for Sorry. him. Sorry. Big point I forgot to mention yeah, there. In, that yeah. someone named Calderon is the one that put the bounty on Tubbs. And, he's, and they said, he's dead, fool. <laughs> Chump, don't you know he's dead? Yeah. And he said, no, he's not. He's very much alive. And then in the file is a picture of an Angelina. And that's what triggers this flashback montage of the last time and the only time. Yeah, we've the seen only Angelina. time. Let's go back over that. I have many questions about this. Why does he flash back to all the stuff that happened with Angelina before he flashes to when his brother was murdered? He had one sweaty night with her and that takes precedent over his brother being murdered you get the jan hammer like porn music going behind it too <laughs> yeah you know? I, had questions. Then, I asked dominic like uh, do you think they had pictures of them having sex that's how he's remembering it because like in it he's like looking at the picture and he's like oh there she is on the beach wait there she is when her dad died she's there crying us rubbing our feet together <laughs> yeah, yeah, <that's> <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that that's my favorite part is that the montage ends and the tub's looking at the pictures it's almost like he's looking at pictures of her on the beach and then her dead dad and it's yeah. like this is the weirdest memories uh <laughs> scrap album i've ever seen yeah who took the pictures of her on the beach and then the picture of her dad did tubs just yeah. came that means that sunny t- t- took that pic sunny's that, a creep because yeah. <laughs> it was just the two of them yeah so they were there out would on be that no island pictures. Like, yeah and they didn't have a camera. Okay, we, we gotta stop because they never had a camera in that episode. <laughs> Nobody ever took any yeah. pictures of anything. <laughs> Liars. How many times has Tubbs looked through these pictures? A lot. <laughs> but and just to be clear with the, with with the audience here is that he's having a flashback to Calderon's Return Part Two, which is where he meets Angelina. She finds out that they bone she down <laughs> is Calderon's daughter. daughter. Then, yes, he flashes back to when they kill Calderon at his house. <laughs> when he flashbacks within a flashback yeah. within a flashback. <laughs> and then it goes to that time in the pilot when we first see Calderon and he kills Tubbs' brother. Yes. So that sums up the all only the thing Calderon we didn't see Tubbs is guy. the guy trying to shoot planes out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best one. <laughs> when he snaps out of the flashback montage, Cassio asks Tubbs if he wants protection, but Tubbs says, no, there's just someone trying to chump me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like so much chumping going on in this episode. <laughs> And then Crockett grabs them, and they're going to go see Mendez. So they jump in their car and they start heading over to go see Mendez at the hospital. But they get a call on the car phone that says that Mendez has to have emergency surgery again. They don't know if he's going to pull through. That's that's not what the call's about. We, we can skip this scene. C- Crockett gets a call from his doctor about that burning sensation he's been having in his loins. His VD medication is ready. Let's moving on. Let's get to uh, eating some veggie burgers. <laughs> so yeah, they pull up to the Falcon restaurant, and Crockett says, "Hey, I'll buy you lunch. Lunch is on me. I might as well be the one that buys you your last meal." Ha ha ha! Yeah, ha ha ha! Then Tubbs gets kidnapped. Yeah, <laughs> crack police work there, Crockett. Worse. Your partner being kidnapped, or the tires on your Ferrari being slashed? <laughs> Damn it! And they cut his phone too. <laughs> When they pull up to the restaurant, he says, I'll buy you anything. And, and Tub says, a veggie burger? And then Crockett says, anything but that. Yeah. What do you got against veggie okay. burgers? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, we're going to step outside of Miami Vice for a minute. As my as our resident vegetarians, 
Um, <laughs> if, if you guys had to choose one vegetarian meal, are you going veggie burger or is there something else? I guess like, if my choice is my only choice is at the Falcon restaurant down by the docks, maybe the veggie burger is the best choice. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> no, if we had to choose something that was vegetarian, it would be something Mexican food. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> that's just us. <laughs> gotcha. So Crockett's selfish for taking him to a burger joint. Yeah, okay, we yeah. can move on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Crockett goes in to the restaurant and Tubbs decides that he's going to make a phone call before yeah, he heads so. in. And that's when he gets another laser point from a gun. He sees it like hitting him, in, hitting him in the face. And then when he looks and sees, he sees someone in a van with a gun. And then he turns, he looks to his left. And there's a guy on a mo- motorcycle with a gun in his back. The van comes pulling up. They throw him in the van and they drive away. Sonny is looking watching, at the pies. You know, he's watching through the window. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't want to come out because he didn't want to get shot. I like to so. think he was distracted by the chocolate mousse pie that was inside. Because, <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, the restaurant was one of those restaurants. Yeah, exactly. You walk in, there's the glass case. Of the, pie, yeah. <laughs> the pie has been there for like four years and no one's bought. <laughs> oh, those pies are money. I, I once got a free pie from Marie Callender's one. <laughs> it was a highlight of it. <laughs> Crockett comes running out. He sees that the tire has been shot in his Ferrari and, the, and his car phone has been cut so he can't make any calls. And then we jump to where they've taken tubs. It's like a nice dentist office kind of look <laughs> to us some fake plants purple walls you know kind of it kind of fits with what you would expect to have a children's dentist office yeah. in the 80s <laughs> and then out of the blue here comes angelina walking out grabs tubs walks back and goes points inside of a crib says yeah that's yours she said i have to show you something she goes mm-hmm. come with me i have to show yeah. you something and it was not what he thought it was so <laughs> <laughs> that ain't my baby look at that that ain't my chin <laughs> that ain't my nose. It was like the coldest way between those two on how they said, "You, this is your son. Come walking back, points to him and says, this is your child. And Tubbs has like no emotion on his face. Yeah, and like, Angelina's eh. like, yeah, that's yours. <laughs> well, because yeah, Tubbs is thinking, Dan, I should have pulled out. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> See, if he was prepared, like Alex Rodriguez, he would have made a list of different birth control <laughs> methods. Pulls it out the list. Yep, that's them. That's them. Those are the ones I didn't I, use. I'm more curious about the way she gets a. She basically hires people to kidnap Tubbs at gunpoint. Yeah, I know. To tell him, to tell him he's endangered and you have a son. Like, like that like is to the protect most... him. Yeah, to protect him. I'm yeah, gonna she's kidnap the with craziest sniper. baby mama I have ever met. <laughs> like, she gets a team of guys to hold him at gunpoint, and just to say, like, "Oh, you're in danger." <laughs> like, yeah, of course, you held me at gunpoint. <laughs> I'm in danger from you. Yeah. Well, and the real I didn't know I owed you child support. <laughs> Angelina says she hoped to never see Tubbs again, so he would have never have known that that he had a, a son. But she says that he's in danger because her half brother Orlando, who she's never met except for once when she was a kid, is trying to kill him to get revenge for their dad. For yeah, them killing. and that's a weird story, right? Though, like she never met him, but once, and they gave each other. He gave them these necklaces and said, "You'll always be able to find each other." <laughs> and also, <laughs> only wants to kill Tubbs. Doesn't want to kill Crockett. Wait, only wants Crockett to kill didn't Tubbs. have anything to do with it. She, he's the one that slept with his sister. <laughs> Tubbs got his sister pregnant and then killed his father. Like, in the realm of being a brother and a son, I think maybe you're a little more mad at him than their but partner. But Crockett was the, well, one, that the, one, that the, the one that pulled the trigger. He's the one that actually yeah, kills but Calderon. Tubbs, for one thing, let's get this straight. Tubbs did not have to have sex with her. Okay? <laughs> Add insult to injury. Hey, I had sex with you. I'm never going to see you again. And I just murdered your father. Bye! <laughs> and I left you with a very chubby baby. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> before we leave from angelina she tells Tubbs, i'm gonna give you money and you can leave you can leave anywhere you want to you can escape he says no i'm a cop and he sticks that story throughout the whole episode when we leave yeah, mind her- you she tells him this while he's giving her a sweaty sweaty massage <laughs> they don't need no oils no, well that's that's we're gonna come back to that <laughs> yeah that's a different one though. <laughs> we have a brief scene that, that's not when they're trying to make ricardo Tubbs the third <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> We have a brief scene at the waterfront where we see they end up being two DEA agents. Orlando comes pulling up and out of the car gets John Leguizamo, our big guest star that's in this episode. He gets out there dragging a person behind the car when they come pulling up. 
the DA agents hand Orlando information, and then he asks, "Do you know where the where the officer is? Where the cop is?" They say no, and he points to the guy that they're dragging and says, "You either get me the cop or you get me the information on where to find him." You don't want to end. Basically, you don't want to end up like this guy. John Leguizamo, who is a Colombian actor and comedian, as a comedian, his co- comedy special "Sexaholic" is still one of my favorite stand-up specials of all time. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, it's a good one. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean that that one's always going to rank in my top ten for me. So, and you would uh, obviously you would know him from movies like Super Mario Brothers, where he played Luigi. <laughs> um, he, he was Violator in the Spawn movie. He did that movie, The Pest, <laughs> or uh, Dressed Up in Drag. Two Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything. But here's a few things you might not realize. So one, you know, Vice was his first TV role ever. Wow. This was his introduction. Vice. Yeah, yeah. He also played Madonna's boyfriend in the video for her song Borderline. But did you know he played a terrorist in Die Hard 2? Yes. He did? Yes, he did it. How am I missing... No, remember he's he's at that when they take over that church. He's at that church. He's like working on the computer. Oh yeah, that's right. Remember that is we just him. watched it and I was like, isn't that John Lake was on? Oh yeah, because we watched Die Hard every Die Hard and Die Hard Two every <laughs> yeah, oh, Christmas. Yeah, yeah but, they're the greatest Christmas exactly. movies that have ever been made. But yeah, remember we talked about it. I'm like, See, look, there he is. <laughs> I, I saw that. I saw that and I was like, I'm watching Die Hard Two tonight. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was also the robber in Regarding Henry. Oh, I um, didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Shock. Yeah. I love so, that movie, too. <laughs> he he also played Benny Blanco, the nemesis in Carlito's Way. Yeah, mm-hmm. we knew that one, yeah. This is just for me. Like I, I'm sure, Melissa, you probably knew this, but I had stopped watching this show at this point. But from 2005 to 2006, he was Dr. V- Victor on Clemente ER. on ER. Yep. Oh, yeah, I watched ER all the way to the end. I was at the bitter end where I was like, I don't even know who these people are, but I'm still watching it. (laughs) I I had given up ER at that point. And so I missed like the John Stamos years and when they actually went out and got all the high priced actors. Yeah. And actually, John Lincoln was almost, he was good on it. He was like a a doctor with mental problems. Uh, He's at the end. He had been through like a really good doctor, but he had been through a lot of jobs. He's also done a, a number of voice acting, including uh, playing Sid the Sloth and all the Ice Age movies. Yep. Which mm-hmm. I mean. Well, speaking of terrible things that involve sex, uh, no. we go back to <laughs> Angelina's and the couple, Angelina and Tubbs, are in bed. Sweaty Tubbs is back. <laughs> <laughs> With a vengeance. <laughs> and I'm thinking, because c- they- they're talking about... She offers him again. Here's eight hundred thousand. You can leave Miami. Tubbs says he's a cop. And I'm thinking, should Tubbs calling to the precinct at some point in time and let them know where he's at and that what's going on? What? Maybe he's not that long. It didn't take that long. <laughs> Just saying. We maybe still haven't seen where Tubbs lives, and so he's probably like <laughs> talking about playing house. Hey, I can move in here with your baby. Uh, I would say like I, I don't even your house he has husband. a house. I think he lives. He sleeps in his car. <laughs> like, I've never seen his house. No, I'm saying he didn't take very long. All right, so it was a short. <laughs> no one's worried about him if it only takes like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> he does say that he's going to go take a walk, which means he's going to go. He is going to go down to the precinct. Why did he just say that? Then? I'm gonna take he's going to leave for two hours to go buy condoms because he doesn't want to have another uh, <laughs> Cubs Junior. Whoops, that's what he's going to go do. And can we also mention? But he never asked what the kid's name is until after they have sex. They're like laying in bed. And he's like, what's the baby's name? And she's like, Ricardo Jr. And he's like, oh, what? but you didn't give a crap about what his name was until now. <laughs> I would have named him Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but this is also the last time that Tubbs will see his son ever. Yes. Why you got to yeah, do right. that? <clears throat> Put salt on the wound. <laughs> we go over to the precinct. And, and actually, the kid that is Tubbs' son is wasn't credited in the show. So there's no way to tell who or what he grew up to be or who he was to begin with. So maybe at Comic-Con, there was something from Miami Vice. <laughs> Poor <laughs> orphan know. baby Tubbs. We go over to the precinct and Castillo and Crockett are getting filled in on what's happening. Tubbs is showing up there. He's telling them what's, what's going on. <laughs> And he's uh, like, then I boned her, and now I'm here. No, I'm <laughs> I Tubbs. told her I was going for cigarettes. <laughs> I ain't going back. Tubbs asked Cassio to go easy on the sniper because happened to be one of Angelina's men. That's why he saved them from from being killed in that drug bust at the opening of the episode. And Castillo says, yeah, but cool, I'll call the DA, but you're on your way to the safe house. He he goes, Castillo goes full dad. 
yeah in this, he's all bad in, in, in this, this one <laughs> so and, it, and i don't think but i don't think the safe house is really that safe i think like half of miami knows where the miami vice safe house is. yeah i don't know that yeah i mean since Especially i was considering that the duo take women back to the safe house of them so. i was gonna say that prostitute killed herself yeah and they're the probably house. like ordering pizza <laughs> yeah but he says like no i will not go in the safe house because right like no i won't go i don't want to go <laughs> i can take care of myself i don't need you so then meanwhile why text out talking about how he's very selective with the women he meets. yeah that is amazing that <laughs> While Switek is telling Gina about how he's really selective, except for the case of Angelina, where if they have a lot of money, yes, he wouldn't yes. be so selective. Crockett and Tubbs go into an office room and kick Pete out. Who's Poor doing- Pete. He's just doing his job. <laughs> <laughs> they kick Pete out of the office and say, get out of here. We got to talk about Tubbs' baby. I don't give a shit about your police work. <laughs> yeah, he's like looking at a piece of paper, like filling it out. <laughs> Crockett's like, hey, can you leave? And he's like, okay, yeah, like I'll leave in a couple minutes. And Crockett's like, no, get the hell out of here. Scram. <laughs> Zito my vacation po- request. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Zito pops in and says that there's a call for Tubbs from the DEA. So DEA, he goes and answers the call from the DEA. And they want to talk to him about something. He's like, I can't come meet you right now. How about you come to me? I'm going to go tell Angelina. They want to talk to him about Angelina. Yeah, go, we hear that Angelina's in town. And he's like, yeah. I've already know that. And I know where she is. And they're like, oh, well, can we get in together on this investigation, basically? Yeah, and Tub says, of course, you can come meet us at Angelina's house. And gives them the address. address. (laughs) Yeah, so have they learned nothing from the past two seasons? One, (laughs) the DEA guys are always dirty. Like, every time we meet them in an episode, they're always dirty. And two, the the safe houses are never very safe. Why is Tub drawn in his mouth? (laughs) Well, to be fair, she wasn't in a safe house. She was just out of her own house. But it was still like a safe house for her. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, she was hiding. And so, Tubbs is like, oh, yeah, it's, it's the big house saying, on the end. It's the big house on the end. It's got the light flashing, you know, like big old arrow to it. <laughs> There's like this, you know, buddy, buddy slapping Tubbs on the back of the precinct. Like, congratulations. Well, first Crockett asked him if it was really his kid. <laughs> yeah. He's like, are you sure it's yours? And then Tubbs is like, yeah, well, it's all. I mean, he looks just like me. He's like a miniature me. So it's my kid. <laughs> well, I mean, Tubbs is the first father on, you know, on the show. I mean, none of the other guys have. <laughs> Kids. Ouch. No. To be fair, it's probably I mean, better for Cro- Crockett's, Crockett's kids. mailing and, it in. He, oh, yeah. So I'm saying he literally is. But but to be fair, it's probably better for his son, Billy, or whatever his name is, Tommy, or I don't know. We don't let's, care. Let's He's got it. a new dad now. Yeah, let's face it. By the way, he does have a new dad now. So you're right. He does. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's face it. Like He's safer without being by Crockett. Like Crockett yeah. brings nothing but trouble. The, the, his wife, his ex-wife did the right thing by moving away. Yeah, like, we met <laughs> little Sonny Jr. twice and almost got killed twice. Oh, uh, look at what happened. <laughs> what's going to happen to Tubbs' son? <laughs> <laughs> well, so they just je- like, gradually cruise over to Angelina's and they pull up. Not even in a hurry, people. No, no they just kind of <laughs> saunter over and they pull up. And it's full of police and ambulances. And, and they go DEA running agent. in frantic. Tubbs was running upstairs. Angelina's gone. The guards have been killed, and the baby's crib has been knocked over. And Rico Jr. is gone. He's been kidnapped as well. Also, can we get over? Like, why do you need to knock over the crib to get a baby out of there? Was the baby fighting? Just like, illustrate there. Just buddy. get the baby. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? What do you want? Like, put, put up a huge fight that they have. <laughs> For CSI come in and like do forensics on the crew. Yeah, because the baby was like, uh uh-uh. uh. Well, hey, it's Tubbs' kid, okay? He uh, is a little Rico. Maybe he put he had a little sawed off in there, <laughs> a little miniature one. Dude, that had to be that had to be a pretty impressive group of guys too, because she had like three guys, like yeah, four, uh, three van fulls of guys protecting mm-hmm. her. Also, they didn't even let her like enter the room by herself. <laughs> the guy had to, like <laughs> open the door for her to come through. But yet they, but they outmuscled that baby though. <laughs> Took him back at the precinct. They're waiting for a call from Orlando, and they they do get the call. And so Orlando says, "I want you to meet me at." Lighthouse, Angelina, and the baby will be there. You come alone. She'll be in which the car. Means, which, That's what they said. which means to the Miami Vice Squad means bring every single Miami police officer within. We'll just be sneaky. Yeah, make out point. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it sounded like that too. Like look out point or something. He said like she'll be in the car. Yeah, I said meet me there in an hour. Out at Lighthouse Cove, Orlando is wiring up the car with explosives. They have Angelina tied up and gagged inside of it, and then they've taken. Rico Jr. out of the car 
and just made it look like there was a baby on the car seat so that Tubbs will think that his son is in there. But Orlando says, take the baby back to the main house. So the baby's not in the car. No, the baby's not in the car because that would just be like beyond <laughs> cruel to be on my device. <laughs> and then Orlando says, see you later, sis, and then spits in her face. Yeah, it turns out he's not that great of a brother. And takes her necklace. Um, yeah, rips her necklace off of her. So, But that is the goofiest looking bomb ever. <laughs> it is essentially three packs of cooking dough that say dangerous on them. <laughs> yeah, it's like... it's like In a lunchbox with two blinking lights. <laughs> hey, we've talked about their transmitters apparently in the 80s were like gigantic. So how did anyone have bombs anywhere? Like <laughs> giant ass remotes. At the precinct, they're getting ready to go bust it. Tubbs is getting really nervous. He's scared. He wants full control over this, but Castillo, he's he's in total control of this. He's giving out the rules on what's going to happen. So everyone heads if he's out. he's smart, he should totally go alone. Yeah. We've yeah. been down this road before. And instead, if you go out to Lighthouse Cove and there's 300 Miami Vice police officers or Miami police officers that are there. I don't really understand, like, pretending like they were sneaky, like Calderon's people weren't going to see them. They're, like, right there. I'm like, I don't get this. Like, they're not that far away. If you can see the shack from where you are, even if you have binoculars, but you can still see the car, then they can see you. Yeah. Well, they're close enough that with their binoculars, they can see that there's a bomb in the car. Yeah. Like, yeah. And they can see, like, oh, and there's... Yeah. There's yeah. yeah. So, I think we are going to meet one former cop one ex at the time current cop that are part of the vice family i guess nelson aramas who is the bomb squad guy he was he also like the in the Hall episode smugglers Bruce. <laughs> yes yes <laughs> he was also in smugglers blue blues the only one that gave a damn about trudy and actually saved her life he was a former cop <laughs> If you remember that episode, no one get, cared about Trudy being That's tied up true. strapped to a Crockett bomb. cared. No one even remembered her. It was like at the end of the episode, like, oh, yeah, where's Trudy? Hey, Crockett risked his life. Someone to needs to there. type this. Remember? They, <laughs> yeah. Who's going to type this report about her being kidnapped? Remember, Gina wanted to go, and they said, and, and they said no, Crockett has to go. Crockett's like, hey, I didn't want to go. <laughs> where, where can we go? So, yeah, they sent Nelson, who is a former cop and appears in this episode. And then we also have the SRT team leader, Robert Holscher, who is actually a real-life squad leader of the Metro Dade Special Response Team. That's um, why he was such a bad actor, Dominic. That's the one that was oh, a terrible yeah. actor. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> he was yeah. a cop. <laughs> yeah, because he's not an actor. Because he was a real cop. Yeah, so I guess he handles, his specialty was handling logistics and uh, and as a police liaison, but he was also a gun expert. So he actually appeared in six different episodes as extras and also kind of gave Vice a little bit of actual police knowledge. I guess, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's why everything on there is so realistic. <laughs> <laughs> Plan changes there on on site. And so Crockett jumps into the, the caddy and Tubbs goes driving up to the car where Angelina is tied up. The plan here is that they're going to try and get the transmitter from Orlando. That way they can stop the car you know, from them triggering the explosives in the car. Tubbs pulls up. He gets out. He walks up to the car. He sees Angelina is tied up. He can see the baby. Angelina is trying to tell Tubbs. He's going to kill me no matter what you do. So just save yourself, essentially. Go save you. And then he, he doesn't know about the baby, but, sa but save yourself. And so then he's there's a radio on the hood of that car. And it's Orlando says, okay, now drive up to this shack. And then dude, we're going to... Uh, the, the radio conversation between Orlando and Tubbs is great. Because they're almost arguing. Tubbs actually can negotiate anything at this point. You know, it's like, come to the shed. Tubbs like, no. It's like, okay, what about the robo? Go to the robo. Is that cool? Uh, uh, okay, we'll meet you at the robo. But I want the transmitter. He pulls up to the boat, and a car pulls out from behind the shed. They meet the two guys get out of the car with at, and have Tubbs at gunpoint. So Tubbs is hoping that he's going to get the transmitter from them. He's going to like sacrifice himself to get the transmitter. But when he gets the transmitter, Crockett is going to pop up from the back seat and just start wasting Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> Instead, Angelina finally gets her hands free after struggling, and they turn and see that the car is shaking. She lays on the horn, and it causes the car to explode. So now Tubbs is just so essentially, watching. Essentially, she killed herself, and I don't mm -hmm. exactly get why. To save Tubbs. I mean, at, she did to it to save, save Tubbs, but she was gonna, she was gonna, 
Uh, I mean, they were going to blow her up, but I mean, obviously, Tubbs had a plan. Blowing herself up doesn't stop them from shooting Tubbs. Well, yeah, but she, what, she was, what she was thinking is that no matter what, they were both yeah. going to die. Like, if she died and he died, that she didn't want both of them to die. Yeah, so maybe she thought that by causing the explosion that they would have a shooting chance, which which is exactly what happens. Everyone looks at the, ex- at the yeah. explosion. Crockett pops up out of the back of the caddy and yeah. shoots both those guys. And then we have like a, a platoon-esque style scene where the music ramps up. Tubbs is just lost in the moment, mm-hmm. seeing that his child and his lover have died in an explosion. PD come driving up. There's a shootout with Orlando's men. Orlando's trying to tell his men to stop shooting because the shack is full of explosives. That's why he wanted to get Tubbs into there. Because he was going to blow him up anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Orlando runs out the back door. The building explodes. And it, the cameras shake like Miami like, there Vice was too team. Much explosives. Too much explosives <laughs> in there. <laughs> I think Crockett did it. No, I'm just <laughs> it was Don Johnson that rigged it up. <laughs> when it's all said and done, all of Orlando's men are dead. We can't find Orlando. They think he's part of the dead bodies that are there. The Angelina's dead. They think that Rico Jr. is dead. Everything's just in shambles. Nothing has gone right. Everyone, essentially everyone that they went to go get is dead now. Yeah. One thing I did want to just touch on that I love the park commissioner guy who's like, I'm pretty good with a gun. If you give me a gun, <laughs> yeah, I, I can help. You're like, no, dude, you're like 80. We don't need your help. Thank you, though. Yeah, like, dreaming of being an action hero. Yeah, I, like, I can help. <laughs> sure. It's all said and done, and there's no one left. Tubbs is saying he wants to stick around. <laughs> Sorry, literally, they're all dead. <laughs> Tubbs basically tells Crockett to piss off. I mean, uh, just, he basically just says, like, like go away, Crockett. Because Crockett's, like, sitting there like, hey, buddy, how you doing? You want me to take you out for a milkshake? We can go get some ice cream. <laughs> well, he's trying to be a good friend, right? And yeah, Tubbs he's telling is saying, him, like, no matter what, I'll be here. I don't want, you know, just yeah, as long as you here. Yeah, and Tubbs is that he's going to stick around and wait to see if they have, if they can find any proof that Orlando's actually dead. Croc is like, no, nah, man, come on. I'll go drop you off at home, and then I'll finish up writing up this paperwork for you. So we jump next to, to the precinct, and that's where Crockett is. He's filling out paperwork, and our police buddy... <laughs> Should have the day off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Our police buddy comes walking and he drops a packet of evidence and he says, here you go. This is the leftover paperwork and stuff that we found at the crime scene. One of them includes something that's a letter that's from the DEA. It's a it's a file. It's uh-huh. part of a file that they had on on tubs. Yeah. Yeah. And so Croc is like, that's interesting. He's reading it. Yeah. Yeah. We should go check in on the DEA, like what John was saying, because the DEA can never be trusted. Nope. <laughs> so the next day, Crockett, the next I morning. Think I think it's that same day. It's okay. the same day. He leaves right yeah. from there. Yeah, he like, right leaves off. from the precinct. We yeah. get a short scene where he stops and talks to a security guard who he's kind of a dick to. Security guard's that like, security guard was the annoying hell? as hell. Like, we know it's going to bring you a freaking hey. Danish, all right? <laughs> hey, man, he's a, who knows what he's actually guarding? He's This is probably the highlight of his day. He probably talked about that for like two weeks. <laughs> You'll never guess. These two Miami Vice pe- people showed up, uh, one right after the other. I wonder what they were doing. Sorry, I, I'm going on. Um, <laughs> and then Crockett shows up back at the Falcon Diner because that's apparently where everybody eats. <laughs> There in Miami, <laughs> finds Tubbs, climbs in the car with Tubbs, and tells him, like, let's not just murder these guys right here. <laughs> and then that's what happens. That's when Harrison comes out of the Falcon restaurant. And they go, hey, you. <laughs> yeah, Tubbs goes, hey, Harrison, I got I to gotta ask you something. Shootout begins. Tubbs is, like, laser focused because he tells Sonny right before it happens, like, he murdered my whole family. He ratted out my entire family. Well, because for one day. <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs shoots one of them as the shootout happens. The other Harrison gets into the car, tries to drive away. Tubbs gets his gets old sawed off. He shoots off him right in the head. head. Shoots him, yeah. And then the car in the careens head. into the water <laughs> yeah. and sinks in and the they water. Never go jo- I was telling Dominic, like, I guess they're for sure that guy's dead, right? Because they're not even like you could see the bubbles like coming out of the car. Like, <laughs> we're not gonna go get him. <laughs> no one's gonna get him. They just like everyone just watches the car sink and then they just leave. Let's yeah, that car here. sinks fast. And if you remember in the pilot. Tubbs had the opportunity to shoot and kill Calderon. Mm-hmm. And if you would have done that, all, all this of this Calderon stuff would have never happened. Or if he just went over so had sex with want- Angelina. <laughs> <laughs> and now we go to the final scene of the episode. It's the funeral for Angelina and Rico Jr. And the whole Vice team is going while they're paying their last respects before they get buried. A van pulls up and it's, it's flowers being delivered. 
Sonny goes over, grabs the flowers, gets the card, sees the card that's for Tubbs, walks it over to him, hands it to Tubbs. Tubbs is standing in front of the caskets. He opens up the letter. In there is Angelina's necklace that Orlando had ripped off her neck. And then a note that says, I'll be back. So Orlando has survived that attack. And as the Calderon story can continue, and Tubbs is left to bury his lover and his son. That is the end of season two. We get left. So at the end of season one, we were left with the Lombard story, which we feel like we should have been left with the episode before with yeah. Evan, but we're left with, with the Lombard story. But season two, I think we're getting a slight taste of what to expect in season three, because this is devastating for Tubbs and the Vice family, knowing that one of their own has lost his lover and his child. So on that somber note, <laughs> let's go talk about the music. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, I, I peeked ahead, and it's a couple of people that we've heard before. So compared to our mammoth music that we had last week with so many great musical artists, this week seems like it's the same old record for Miami Vice. Fitting for season two because he could not find his way out of the music segment. We get <laughs> Phil Collins again. Because, you know, Phil Collins just won't go away. He's sleeping on Michael uh, Philip Michael Thomas's couch at this point. <laughs> it just won't go away. We can get into him a little bit. I mean, uh, we've already talked about him. Let, let, let's talk about how he, he was a child actor. His dad was a theater theatrical agent. And so he was actually used in a few different things as a child actor, including being an extra in the Beatles film, A Hard Day's Night, mm. and being in the movie Chitty Chitty Bang Bang in a scene that was actually cut. So he's not actually in the movie. No way. No way is yeah. he in those. Wow. wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, he's just, he's everywhere. His first record deal was with a band called Flaming Youth. They disbanded after a year of touring. After that, he played the drums on George Harrison's song, Art of Dying. Fun story, he when he auditioned for Genesis in 1970, he auditioned at Peter Gabriel's parents' house. And they actually let him go swimming in their pool before he actually <laughs> auditioned. Sweet! <laughs> he also did some work for Disney doing the soundtrack to Tarzan and also the soundtrack to a movie called Brother Bear with Tina Turner. Mm, yep. Yeah, I yep. remember that movie. He also did some voice acting for some Disney stuff, too. He did two voices in the movie Balto, one voice in the Jungle Book 2. See, I am thoroughly convinced that my love for Phil Collins isn't because I willfully fell in love with him. It's because of subliminal messaging and them putting Bill Collins in literally everything. <laughs> Especially in the 80s, yeah. He even made an acting cameo in Steven Spielberg's 1991 movie, Hook. I don't even remember uh -oh. him. He's a policeman in it or something, isn't oh, he? Oh, yeah, yeah. Remember, it's like something when they go to England and mm -hmm. he's like in the street. Like a, I think he's a policeman. I want to say he's a policeman when they, when they report the kids missing. Remember, they can't find the kids because they're mm -hmm. in they're in hooks or whatever. Yeah. Neverland. You see, and, and I'm going to make honest admission here and being how much of a fan of the 80s I am. I do not like Hook. What? And that's going to hurt a lot of people when <laughs> I say that. And I don't give a shit you about Rufio. monster. Yeah, I don't give a shit about Rufio. And there's a lot of people who really love him as a character. But I love Robin Williams, but I don't give a shit about Hook. You're a like, monster. <laughs> Dude, like, out of everything Peter Pan... Everything, like even the new like pan and all the other stuff, like out of all of it, Hook's the only thing I can even stomach from the Peter Pan. I love stuff. Peter. I love Hook. You know that movie's almost three hours long, right? Yeah, we watched yeah. it. I love Hook. So, <laughs> 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 okay. So last thing. So Dominic, something you did you know Phil Collins is partially deaf in one ear? Ah, something we have in common: hearing loss. Although his yeah. may be uh, his is from an related. infection he had in two thousand. Uh, so it's actually not from playing the drums, which man, you would think. That's a bad infection. Uh, don't, yeah, don't you be threatening out there. Don't you be floating out there that Phil Collins has health problems. He's going to live forever. <laughs> <He's a> good... <laughs> <laughs> Moving along, we also have After the Fire by Roger Daltrey. This song was actually written by Peter Townsend. And so, um, look, I'm going to be honest with you. We already talked about Roger Daltrey. There's nothing more interesting there. <laughs> isn't even when i was doing the research i got distracted and i ended up doing more research on john fogarty than anything else so how did you guys like to talk about john fogarty 
Look, I'll, I'll be I'll admit it. I like CCR better than I like the Who. Nothing against the Who, but I like CCR better. What do you got on John Fogarty? John Fogarty was born in Berkeley, California and grew up in El Cerrito, California. So he's from our neck of the wood. He is the lead singer and guitarist for CCR, Credit's Clearwater Revival. His older brother, Tom, was also in the band and also a guitarist and former lead singer. He was actually the original lead singer. In the late 50s, inspired by Little Richard and Bo Diddley, John and his brother, with a few friends of theirs, Doug Clifford and Stu Cook, formed Tommy Fogarty and the Blue Velvets. Catchy. In 1965, yeah, exactly. Catchy. In 1965, they changed their names to the Gollywogs. Not so catchy. <laughs> <laughs> so between 65 and 67, John Fogarty actually joined the Army Reserves. He was discharged in 67, rejoined the band. And actually, I want to say in that time is when he actually spent some time in like New Orleans, which is why they had that kind of bluesy Southern soul uh, sound to them, at least for most of the music that we're familiar with. He rejoined the band in 67 and they changed their name to Credence Clearwater Revival. And that's when he would replace his brother on lead vocals. So their first hits would start uh, right away in 1968. Song Suzy Q and be followed on the next album with Proud Mary. This is where we start to get into a little bit about John Fogarty as a person. 1971, John got a pretty big head on him. He started like talking about how he was so, you know, because he was writing the music and he was like really, not only was he writing the song lyrics, but he was also kind of composing stuff. He basically was like saying like, I'm more important than the, to the band and everybody else. Uh -huh. So I deserve more stuff. Mm. So his brother Tom up and quit. Stu and Doug actually stayed around only because John promised to give them more uh, privileges in writing lyrics and other stuff like that. He basically said like, I'll let you guys be more part of the band. Please don't leave yet. <laughs> they record their final album at Mardi Gras in 1972, and then would shortly dis would disband right after that. <laughs> their only reunion with all four actual members was at Tom Fogarty's wedding in 1980. Other than that, not all four of them have ever played together, and actually only like three or four times have even one or two of them played together. In 1973, he'd start his solo career, John Fogarty would. But instead of just going under the name John Fogarty, he actually recorded under the name The Blue Ridge Rangers, in mm. a, uh, uh, which is the name of a fictional band in which he was the only member. <laughs> <laughs> That's why yes. it's fictional. <laughs> so he, he recorded a number of stuff as the Blue Ridge Rangers, and then in 1974, he would eventually start recording as just John Fogarty. As he got into the later 70s and started to gain traction in his solo career, he wasn't like a commercial success on his own. And he blamed the on the fact that he was distracted and stressed out due to the fact that his former record label when he was with CCR, Fantasy Records, actually owned all of his music rights, all of his international music rights. Mm -hmm. So he owned all the stuff that he, that he sold in the United States. But anything he sold overseas was owned by Fantasy Records. Even though he was signed by As Asylum Records, that's who he was actually doing work, uh, recording records for. So in order to finally break his contract with them, he gave up all rights to CCR's music to Fantasy Records. Ah, so that's why he there was that big dispute because he didn't he he gave them up so he could go back to start. So he'd go back and make music. He gave up CCR, the, his rights to CCR's music so that he could make money all to make be the only one be able to make money off of all of his solo work. Mm. And that cost him millions and millions of dollars. A CCR yeah. is much bigger than anything he ever did solo. So and actually it, there was even more legal trouble because uh, immediately after doing that, his first like two songs he came out with after that were basically bashing the head of fantasy records so they would sue him again he actually would win in court and counter sue them because uh he was able to prove that the songs weren't actual rip-offs of ccr music which i guess they were trying to say like not mm -hmm. only was he like disparaging them but he was using like the riff from green river mm -hmm. uh, and a few other things but because of all of that from 72 to 87, he essentially refused to play any Credence Clearwater Revival music at any show. 
<laughs> except for like a handful of like special shows like he, when he would do like a benefit mm-hmm. uh, other than that he never played the music except for I guess at his brother's wedding his brother would actually die in 1990 of AIDS which he contracted from blood transfusions so even though his brother died they were still on, they, they weren't on speaking terms when his brother died in 1993 CCR was inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in which John Fogarty refused to play with, with band members Stu and Doug. So Stu and Doug essentially played the music portion with like Bruce Springsteen and a bunch of other people. As Fogarty said, nope, I'm not getting on stage with those jackasses. <laughs> and he's still doing solo work. Not to give myself away as being someone that watches The Voice, but he was actually on The Voice <laughs> as like a guest. Not guest judge, but as like one of the like artists they brought in to help the other guys. Mm-hmm. But, but you don't um, watch it. During the show. But yeah, you don't watch it at all. Yeah, yeah, but I don't watch it. I don't watch it. So, but yeah, so there's your music. <laughs> well, I do appreciate the the change from Roger Daltrey and The Who over to John Fogarty because it was much more interesting than whatever The Who is up to, especially because you have the ass John Fogarty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, let's go talk about our final thoughts on this episode. And uh, I'm sure Melissa will have a very toned down and short opinion on this I have this episode. no opinion. <laughs> All right, guys, I will kick off this week's final thoughts on this episode because we're going to come back and do a season two recap e- episode. So I'm not going to go into a long details of what I thought about season two. I'll just stick to this episode. This was a really good episode and it was a really good tubs episode. And it's been really frustrating at times that we don't get as much tubs personal as we do about Tubbs, the fantastic police officer, as we know him. So we get much more Crockett personal than we do anyone else. And so this was really great to see him personally to get the Calderones back. Because to be honest with you, all the best episodes of Miami Vice, if you do a top 10 so far of the two seasons, all of the Calderone episodes are in that top 10. They're all the best episodes. And then there's some others that are in there. So I was really happy this was a Calderone story. John Nagozamo was good. It was good all around. I really enjoyed it. But I saw the cliffhanger and I'm hoping... That in the future, like, okay, great, we'll have another Calderon story. And I looked it up and we had you, we will have another Calderon story in season three. And so I'm really happy that that's not going away. But I'm not going to point out what the big pothole is here because I'll let Melissa talk about that. I thought this was a great way to end season two. It was a better ending than it was for season mm-hmm. one. So I was really happy with this episode. I thought it was really good. John, what are your final thoughts? I, I agree with you. I, I love the episode. I love the Tubbs heavy episode. I love the fact that we got to revisit the sweaty tubs and he has a kid <laughs> and all the personal details. John likes sweaty um, tubs. <laughs> I, I was a little disappointed in that we got all these interesting new things about Tubb with having Angelina come back and Tubbs having a kid and then they all go away at the end of the episode and we're back to just refer to Tubbs. A single detective who doesn't apparently have a home. Um, <laughs> so, I, I, you know, it would have been nice if a little bit it had stayed around. I'm very happy for having a Tubbs heavy episode. I'm still wondering whatever happened to the whole pirates wanting to kill Crockett thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just like, like, we're just going to let that one go. And it's like, so we have this unfinished storyline at the end of season two that we're not going to revisit with Crockett, and then now we end season we end the season with an unfinished storyline with Tubbs that's not ever gonna be completely finished. I will say if you played Ricardo Tubbs Jr. on we Miami know who Vice, you are. <laughs> we wanna know who you are. Please text us, email us, you can find us um, on the website on Twitter. <laughs> We're looking for you. We wanna know. <laughs> I'm gonna start. I'm gonna send his picture to uh, to, to John Lucia Walsh. O. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John Walsh. Yeah, let's start getting it, getting these pictures on some milk cartons. I want to find out who this person is. <laughs> well, Melissa, I set you up for last because, as you mentioned last week, you've been through Miami Vice six times. Now. Yep. You you know this show better than any of us. That me and John combined because we're all we're both watching it for the first time. You're newbies. No. And. One of the great things I love about you coming on this show is that you can you have an opportunity to be like, hey, these are these things from Miami Vice that have always bugged me or things I always love. And you have like a sounding board now to get those things out there. And this was one of those episodes that has 
bugged you forever. Yes. Right? This, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I love this episode. Every single portion of this episode, I love it. It is the epitome of what is good about Miami Vice for me. It, I mean, I don't, I love Crockett and I love all the details in his life, but I love that it was a Tubbs episode. I love everything about it, but it upsets me, really upsets me. That's one of those episodes where I was crushed after it. And I was like, what? Like the, he lost his family and he thinks, he thinks that the baby's dead, but the baby's not dead. Oh, mm-hmm. for sure. They're going to bring back John Leguizamo and they're going to finish out the story. Okay, that's great. And when he comes back, then Tubbs is going to know his kid is alive. Spoiler alert, he never sees his kid again in the episode where John Leguizamo comes back as Calderon Jr. or whatever, his, the son, Orlando. <laughs> they don't talk about the son. They never talk about Rico Jr. So it never gets brought up again. And what I told Dominic when we talked about it is that what is so upsetting about that whole situation is apparently I think of them as like real people. (laughs) 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 They never give Tubbs a serious love interest. He never does. He never has like a really serious love interest. He never gets married. Mm -hmm. He never has children in the show run. He never gets married, never has children. So that's like them killing off those people. It's like the last opportunity for him to have a serious thing. And Mm -hmm. it's sad. Like it's crushing. mm -hmm. It's crushing to find out. That he never finds out that his son is still, still alive. alive. He buries his son, yeah. his only son. He thinks because he's for the dead. run yeah. of the show, he's never going to have kids. Nope. That's his only son. No. He buries his son, and his son is still alive. And the show never goes back to it. Never goes back to it. And they do. They will talk like he will talk about when someone has kids or like kids or something. He will say like, "Yeah, I lost a child," and it's like, "Oh, you didn't lose a child. He's still alive." <laughs> But so no. if you have seen Ricardo Tubbs Jr., <laughs> you can find us on Twitter. We are also on YouTube. Um, Dom, what, what, what's the Instagram, email? Everyone. That's, that is going to do it for us this episode. You can email us. Go with the heat at gmail.com. You can let us know what your thoughts are on this episode. If you know where he is. Yeah, if you know anything about Rico Tubbs Jr., where he disappeared to, he's got to be like... 31 yeah or let's see here it's 1986 we're so gonna he's two years old <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're gonna reunite reunite T- ricardo tubbs jr with his dad <laughs> special and that is the cell phone video of it <laughs> <laughs> that is gonna do it for us this week this is the last episode of season two we hope you enjoyed this episode we would love to hear from you what your thoughts are on season two and what your thoughts are on this episode the reason why we would love to hear from you is because we're going to be off next week i'm traveling we have some other things that are coming up so this just worked out perfectly that we can finish up season two before i was hitting the road we would love to hear from you what your thoughts are and what your favorite moments are from season two email us go with the at gmail.com let us know what your favorite moments are because we're going to do a season two recap episode where we go through all of our favorite moments from season two and our favorite music and we're gonna go through all that stuff and then we will have another episode where we're gonna look forward to season three which is the most packed of guest stars of any season of miami vice so we have a lot to look forward to new showrunner new type of music new color tones for the for their costumes, new storylines, new darker, grittier storylines in Miami Vice. So we have a lot to look forward to in season three. We hope you enjoy. Spoiler enjoyed. alert. I will not be referencing Phil Collins, not once during the recap. <laughs> you're, you're dead to me, Phil. You're dead. <laughs> be sure to check out the website, goattheheat.com. Make sure to give us a vote or a rating on your podcast app of choice that way it helps other people find the show and again email us goldie at gmail.com we'd love to hear from you that's gonna do it for us this week and we'll see y'all next time bye pals